Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Coaching Conversations. I'm excited to be joined tonight by Ellie Nassif, the State Youth Referee Administrator from MSRC. That's the Massachusetts State Referee Committee. Uh, tonight's meeting is in a meeting format, uh, so you are welcome to turn on your cameras if you'd like to. Please use the chat box. Um, we will open it up to questions and comments throughout, um, and we are hoping to make this a conversation rather than a presentation. Um, so please feel free to jump in with any questions you may have. Uh, Ellie, I will hand over to you and uh, let you present your screen. Thank you, appreciate it, Rob. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Rob said, I'd like this to be a conversation tonight. <clears throat> uh, Welcome everybody. My name is Eli Nassif. I am state referee administrator, uh, state youth referee administrator. Almost gave myself a promotion there. Um, I have been a referee for too many years. Uh, more specifically, certified as a uh, grassroots referee, or what used to be known as a grade eight referee, uh, for at least uh, twenty something years. Uh, before that, I played. Uh, up to college and did amateur games as well as a player. Uh, I also coached uh, both youth and uh, adults. Uh, and uh, obviously when I got too fat and too old and too bald, they said, we don't want you on the field anymore. Is there anything else you could do? And I figured maybe I can uh, instruct and assess. And this is how I ended up here today. Uh, this is my name and my contact information. Uh, please, if you feel the need to contact me, do not hesitate to do so. It is always my pleasure to talk to coaches because we can always learn from coaches. You guys are as integral to the game as we are. And we're going to be talking a little bit about tonight, uh, a little conversation. I'm not here to scold you. I'm not here to tell you don't yell at the referees. I'm simply here to have a conversation with you guys and maybe give you some food for thought about the referees and who the referees are that are doing your games. Uh, my partner in crime is Kevin Suarez. He is the director of referee development. Uh, very nice guy. And he also responds uh, very, very easily to any questions or inquiries. I'll put this up at the end of the uh, presentation as well so you guys can use it later on. Uh, before I start, is there any questions anybody has? Please feel free to use the chat. Uh, I do want this to be a conversation. I don't want to talk all the time, so please feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, we both know that without referees, there would be no games. And realistically speaking, coaches are just as important because the players need somebody to guide them. So we both are very important to the game and we need to work together to make sure that the game is uh, well served. So if we talk about the job of a, co of a referee, of a, I'm sorry, of a, of a uh, coach, I'm sure you have many aspects to your job. Uh, one of them at least is a teacher and instructor. And I'm sure most of you can come up with a number of different uh, job descriptions of what you do as a coach, uh, and the least of which is all of these. I think they all apply, and I'm sure you guys can come up with some more. As you look at this list, you'll get, you're gonna, I'm sure you're going to nod your head and say, yeah, that looks about right what we do. But I did highlight one word, uh, one, one particular uh, role that you have, and that's role model. And I'm doing that for a reason. Let's keep that in mind. We are going to revisit that a little bit later on. Uh, uh, obviously, scheduler, chauffeur, uh, arbitrator, medic, first person that gets called when somebody gets injured. Coach, come on on the field. We'd love to see what's wrong with this, with this uh, player. So you guys are responsible for a minimum of 15 players or kids and their parents. And I like to submit that in some cases, the parents are even tougher than the kids to deal with. And I do understand that. We do understand that. You, do, you, you deal with them for an average of three times a week, two hours each time. So you guys have a lot on your plate and we get that. You have a lot that you're dealing with and it's not just simply 
uh, coaching the team, but you're doing a lot more than just that. And U.S. soccer and everybody else around you is put, are putting more on your plate by having you take safety courses and uh, concussion courses and all the other stuff that they're asking you to do. We, we are sympathetic to, to your plight. And by the way, everybody wants to win. If you're not winning, everybody gets upset. And again, it's part of your job. You have to find a way to do it. And sometimes with not the best quality players that you may have, or with not enough players in some cases. So let's look at the referee's job description. Do those look familiar? Obviously, it's not as extensive as uh, the, the coach's uh, job description, but it does look very similar. We do have to understand what's going on. In some cases, we do babysit the players on the field to make sure that they're not being uh, uh, pertinent or impertinent to everybody. We try to do the best that we can. And we only do this, we're only responsible for the players on the field for about two hours once a week. So who does have the tougher job? There's no doubt in my mind you guys do. Absolutely, you guys do. Let's talk about decisions for a moment. Uh, according to USSF, they did actually do a study and they came up with about nine to 10 decisions are made by a referee every minute of a game, every minute. Some of them we do subconsciously, but we are making those decisions. And by not making a decision sometimes, that is in itself a decision that we make as referees. By not calling that foul, that's a decision that we are making. And if you multiply that by, let's say, just a 70-minute match, that's six to 700 decisions that we make in one game. And even if you are talking about a youth game, it can be as much as four to 500 uh, decisions in a game. That's a lot of decisions for a young man to make. And if we think about it, uh, and I'm not talking about the adult referees, I'm talking here mostly about the 20 years or younger. Uh, and if you think about it, think about their decision-making process. For those of you who have uh, teenagers at home, you do realize what their decision-making process is like uh, whenever you ask them to make a decision. So who are the people making those decisions? It's very obvious that it's not the person on the left of your screen. It's mostly the people on the right. And these are the young lady and, and young man that are, that are out there given a whistle and trying to arbitrate this, these particular game that you guys uh, are so passionate about. Here are some of the examples we're talking about. Is it a foul? If not, what is the restart? Does it, do we do advantage? Is the ball in or out? And by the way, for those of you who don't believe that we have video replay, we do have video replay in every single one of our games. And if you don't believe me, Ask every parent who's got their phone out taking videos of what's going on on the field, and they're very happy to share the video with us. So in a sense, we do have video review, but we, don't, we can't use it, fortunately, in some cases. So let's talk about this, making these decisions. I'm going to show you a few videos, and I want you to think about whether or not this is a foul. So they're going to start relatively easy, but we'll see where we go from there. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Anybody has any doubts that this is a foul? I would hope not. Absolutely. Just about anybody can make that call, right? How about this one? That's also pretty straightforward. I don't think anybody's going to argue that there's a foul there. And very similarly, very similarly, you're going to see it's not just men, it's women as well who do these things. So very straightforward fouls, no issues. Any problems with calling these fouls? I hope not. Now we come to this particular one. And I'm going to replay it just for everybody's 
Now, it's a little bit tougher decision. If you're the coach of the white team, you're going absolutely great play, fantastic defending, no foul. If you're the coach of the blue team, you're screaming at the ref, hey, she got wiped out. How is that not a foul? Well, that's a little bit tougher to decide, isn't it? So we go on to this one. Was there a foul there? How often do parents scream whenever their child falls to the ground, whether there's a foul or not? Does that affect your thought process as well? That's a much tougher decision, isn't it? Let me play it one more time and have you guys really try to figure out, is there a foul here? Or are these two players just simply competing for the game, for the ball? There is no answer to this one. In my opinion, by the way, there is no foul there. The actual foul is the handball that the player handled the ball when he fell to the ground. That's my opinion. It's one person's. So do we expect the referees to get every decision correct? All of them? Well, maybe not. Okay, I see a lot of people shaking their heads. So is there a critical number that starts to upset you? What is that number? Is it five? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the number. Maybe it's the critical decision where is it inside the box? And are you losing and time is running out? Or are you winning and your call, the call goes against you? Does that make it a little bit more tough to swallow? And that's when we get upset. So it's not a consistent thing on your part, is it, when you get upset? I want you to watch this video. And how many people think there's a foul here that deserves, is it a yellow card or a red card? You look closely at this, the red player was actually grabbing the player, the yellow player's arm and slapping himself in the face. Now, the object of this video is not to show you that players cheat, and they do in some cases. And obviously, this is not going to happen in our games, are they? But the point is, the angle of view can be very critical to how the referee makes the call and how the coach makes the call. From your distance at the middle of the field or wherever you are on the bench, you're looking across the field trying to judge whether this is a foul. All you can see from your angle is that somebody actually fell to the ground and you think that he got slapped. So it's a tough call for us to make from that far away yet you're screaming at your fourth official or at the AR next to you, why aren't you calling this? In the meantime, this is exactly what we see. Most towns have 80 to 100 games in a weekend. There's about 4,000 games statewide on a given spring weekend. 4,000 games, and by the way, that number is increasing as we bring in more leagues and more players who want to play the game. Massachusetts in 2017 had over 5,000 referees. With COVID and with other, other related reasons uh, or unrelated reasons, we're down to 3,700 last year. That's a reduction of 1,300 referees in five years. Now, if you think about it for a moment, you've got 4,000 games in a weekend, 3,700 referees. Let's not talk about people who are not available because they're sick or they're going on a vacation or they're going with their parents or they have graduation. Any number of reasons that brings it down to about 2,500 people that are trying to service 4,000 uh, 4, games in a weekend. So that's a lot of people, games that very few referees are trying to service. Those 3,500 referees, 
3,500, uh, 3,700 referees, 3,500 are grassroots or entry level referees. More than half are under age 18. And those are my charges. These are the people that I'm responsible for. Those under 18 are the ones that are servicing your game. In a lot of cases, ladies and gentlemen, they have less experience as a referee than your players have as, as players. I want you to keep that in mind. They are learning the, the, the art of refereeing. It is not a skill that's acquired. Some of it is, but it is an art that they are learning. Uh, recognizing a foul is not as easy as you saw. And 830 are over 35, with a large number of those are over 50. So the, the, the population is on both ends of the spectrum with very few in the middle. And we understand part of the reasons behind that. Uh, in the, in the mid-20s, they basically just got out, of got out of college. They're getting jobs. Life is happening. They get married. They have children. And then before you know it, they're already at 40. And that's when they realize, oh, I want to get back to referee. So it's not just simply uh, because they're, they're too old or too young. Okay. Uh, these are percentages. We don't care about that. Now it becomes a numbers game. By the way, uh, during the, the high school season, we even have less referees on the weekend in colleges. So most teams play one or two games per weekend. Most referees do at least six games in a weekend. And I want you to think about the, the toll that takes on a 16, 17, 18 year old. They think they can beat the world, but believe me, by the third game, they are tired and their decisions cannot be as good as they should be. We have no choice but to do that. Assigners have no choice but to do that to them. It also makes financial sense for them to be at a field to do three games instead of bringing in one referee for each game. We don't have the numbers and it helps them so that they could pay for it because some of these people travel 60, 70 miles to do a game. So it's, it's not simple. It's not as easy as finding somebody, hey, just go out here in the backyard and do your game. We wanna make sure that we have the best qualified referee for your game. Who would you rather have? How many people would say the person on the left? So if you think about it from a coaching perspective, the person on the left has a lot less experience than the person on the right. We're trying to get this person on the left to start picking up both feet instead of standing there in the middle of the field, making the call from 60 yards away. And we're trying to instill into the younger crowd that it's not, it's not fair for them once they become referee to basically kick back and just don't do the work. We know the game requires these days for you to be close for us as referees to be close to the action and get the best view so that we can make the correct call. And we are working very hard on instilling that into all our referees. They have to work at least as hard as the players. We know safety is your concern. Safety of the players is everybody's concern, ladies and gentlemen. We believe it. It's not just our concern, it's your concern as well. It should be your concern. And I would submit to you guys, and again, food for thought, I'm not the only one responsible as a referee for the safety of the player. The way you teach your players should also be to play in a safe manner. Uh, don't allow the parents to tell their kids, take them out. Don't allow the parents to say, push them, get them out of the way. These are very entice, uh, 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 words that really uh, excite players and get them going. Uh, if you don't think they hear their parents and listen to them, then I think you're probably not real, being realistic. Parents have a lot of influence on their kids, even though sometimes the kids are embarrassed by their parents. I know that, but they still listen to them anyways. So please think about the way you train your kids about safety, because it is all our work. And by the way, 
uh, safety for an 18 year old uh, is putting on no helmet, getting on a skateboard and going downhill without the helmet. Is that safe? That's their idea. Oh, that's okay. We can do that because we're indestructible. Now try to communicate the question of safety on the field to a person who doesn't understand that that's an unsafe action. Let's talk a minute about the abilities. Do all your players have all the same skills and abilities? If you did, I mean, even at the highest level, that doesn't happen. There's always the better player. There's always the one who's more skilled. There's always more of a team player. And that translates the same way into our referees. Not every referee has the same skill and abilities that you would like in all the referees. And I know what the next thing you're going to ask me is consistency. We just want you to be consistent. You're absolutely correct. But I'm going to ask you, are your players consistent from game to game? Are they consistent from half to half? So if you're not expecting your players to be consistent, why is the expectation so much higher from the same age player of people who are refereeing the game? Now, again, please understand I'm talking about the young people. If, if you've got a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old who's not doing their job, have at it. Yell at them all day. I'll come and help you with that too because that person should know better. But that young man or young woman who's out there at that age group, who's, who's 14, 15, 16 years old, they're not going to have the same consistency from game to game that you expect of everybody. Players, how do they get better? They practice. And it's easy. You get your team together and you start practicing. You put together a, a, a friendly with another team and you practice and the players get better. So how does a referee get better? In order for a referee to actually practice their, their skill, they have to get into a game because otherwise they're not really practicing. We can show them, okay, so let's think about it this way. <laughs> if you take your team, put them in a room, show them a bunch of videos, and then on Saturday, go out and play the game. Do you think they're going to perform? They're going to be lost. And it's the same thing with referees. We can show them all the videos and tell them what a foul is by showing them videos. But until they actually hear that sound of two players coming together, the, 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 the noise it makes, uh, that really doesn't impact them until they actually visually see it on the field. When they're running and their eyes are bouncing up and down and they're trying to figure out whether it's a foul or not or whether it's a handball or not, in the middle of a heated game, it's a very difficult decision to make compared to sitting in a video in a room watching a video. We don't have practices. You guys do. So please give us a break on that idea. How well do you all know the laws of the game? I'm sure most of you are going to tell me, oh, we know them very well. Well, did you know that it's a, a free app? And one of the wonders about the free app is that it automatically uploads the new changes every year. So all you have to do is basically tell it, okay, go ahead and do the, uh, the changes. And by the way, there are changes every year to the laws of the game. Some of them are simple and small. Some of them are really large and uh, sea changes that we haven't seen in a long time. For example, when they uh, changed the, uh, and this is quite a few years ago, the uh, pass back to the goalkeeper. That was a major change back then. Uh, they made it uh, about two or three years ago, they changed the drop ball procedure. Uh, that's a major change that a lot of people are having trouble with, even new referee or uh, experienced referees. So. Please, if I may suggest to you, download the free app. What are we as MSRC, Massachusetts State Referee Committee, doing to improve the referee's uh, skills? We are taking input from leagues and coaches on where our weaknesses are and trying to focus the, uh, those classes to, them, to those weaknesses. 
trying to understand where we can do better as referees and trying to instill that into our, our referee corps. Uh, we are doing field session and specific, specified training. We do assessments, we do research, we do mentoring, and we have two groups uh, or three groups actually called PrEP and GRP. PrEP is for the people who are just starting out as referees. We get together on a monthly basis. We watch videos and discuss some of the different aspects of what the referee did right and what the referee could have done better. Uh, and they're usually very simple type videos. They're not complicated videos. Uh, we also have a more advanced for the uh, group for the more advanced referees where we go in depth and talk about uh, complicated offside decisions and advantages, et cetera. Now, I wanna take a moment to talk about GRP. For those of you who don't know what GRP, that's the Genesis Referee Program, uh, where we, are, we take 12 and 13 year olds, uh, give them some basic knowledge, and then put them out on fields doing uh, grade two and three and one, grade one games, where there is no, uh, no, no worry about results. They're basically just learning, just like the players, these seven and six year old players who are just learning the game. Basically the referees are doing the same and we're putting mentors out with them. This is done through your league or through your town. It's a great program that is showing a lot of benefits. One of the greatest benefits is that the parents are learning that the referees are learning like, like the players are. And we've seen a large reduction in parent uh, abuse of referees because of it. So keep that in mind. And if your town does not have done one, one of those programs, we'd like to suggest you do that. For those of you who haven't done this, uh, we'd like you to do Google Matthew's soccer attitude or contagious. This video was produced about 20, uh, 20 years ago. And it's still very applicable today, extremely applicable today. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, it's two videos that are a total of 27 minutes long, but they are very, very topic. The topic is very important. Uh, they talk to referees and players, not just referees, uh, because players are impacted by, by what goes on on the sidelines. And it's really important. It's a great watch you guys i would suggest that highly and i want to um thank mass youth soccer for actually putting this together uh 20 years ago that's very great and i've seen a lot of comments from other states about this video that are very positive remember the word role model ladies and gentlemen you are the role models you are the ones who are basically uh, teaching people, pe the, the young people, how to act. I want you to stop and think about a moment. When you do something, what do the players see? A lot of times we don't think about what our actions are, are reflecting on the player. When you get upset out there, do the players get upset? When you start yelling at the referee, do the players start doing the same thing? Do their parents do the same? So Consider the, the role that you're playing and what you're, what you're setting for standards. You are the standard setter for the entire team. You are the leader. You are the general of that team. And you're the one who is gonna set the expectations and, and basically uh, decide what's acceptable and what's not. Not just for the players, but their, for their parents as well. What can you do to help? please calm down the players and their parents. Mostly their parents, to be honest with you. That's my biggest concern. The players we could deal with because we have, we, have, we have tools that we use as referees to deal with players. We have no tools to deal with, with, with parents. We're not allowed to do that. You guys, that's your, your job. Uh, take a referee course. It is available to you on massref.net. Uh, when I was coaching, I thought I loved the game. And let me tell you something, once I became a referee, that changed my entire perspective 
because I'm not, I don't have skin in the game. Now I became an objective observer. And believe me, most referees, I would, I would submit that 99% of referees are objective observers. They don't care who wins or loses. Uh, and by the way, when you start yelling at a referee, do you think they're going to give you the, the calls or do you think they're going to actually go the other way because you're upsetting them? Just, just a thought. Engage your, encourage your players to take a course. We'd love to have people help, help us out and increase our numbers. Again, the easiest way is to go massref.net and on the splash page, you'll see it in the bottom right here, left hand corner, become a referee. It's, a, it's an easy, easy ask. How about those parents who are yelling at us? Give them an opportunity. We'd love to give them a whistle. If they think they could do better, by all means, please step on the field. Let them know. We'd love to have them. No issues here. And we would like you to give feedback on the referees. Don't give it to the referees. Give it to the league. Uh, give it to your assigner. Uh, just may I, I suggest you wait a couple of minutes and cool down before you do so. The assigner doesn't have to get uh, ear surgery because I'm sure you guys are passionate about this. And we would like you to report referee abuse. And we all know what referee abuse is, especially towards the younger crowd. You can either do it on mass draft or report it to the league or mass youth soccer as well. I want you to remember, if we lose that referee, you're most likely to get somebody with even less experience than the one that's on the field. So please, let's try to maintain, get those and retain those referees as much as possible. And one more thing, how would you like somebody to yell at your son or daughter the way some parents yell at our referees? Would you accept that? I have three kids, now they're men, but they did actually sign up and they took referee courses and were referees for one year. They quit after the one year and the reason they stated specifically was they did not want to be yelled at. And that's the reason my three kids quit. I'm a, bit, I'm a little bit tougher hide. Maybe I should have yelled at them when they were young so they would be used to it. Anyways, overall, in summary, uh, Massachusetts, it's very critically short on referees. We can use everybody as referee. Uh, everyone, we need to work with you guys to make sure that we retain these referees and that we are doing a better job. We want to know uh, how to do a better job. So please feel free to give us suggestions. Uh, we'd love to hear your comments and help us recruit and retain referees. Uh, our, our objective, my objective, is to make sure that we all respect each other. You guys are an integral part of the game. We understand the position you're in and the work that you have to do. And we're trying to convey that to all our referees. You're under a lot of pressure. We get it. We do get it. We just want to be able to help you out. So let's all help each other out. And we're always open to suggestions and questions. I'm gonna open the floor now up I guess I ended up talking all this time. And here's my information again. Rob? Excellent, thank you, Ali, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, while we are waiting for some questions to populate into the chat box, um, I am gonna hit you with a couple of questions and they're not gonna be softballs. Um, so in the spirit of uh, referee and coach cooperation, you mentioned, uh, your three sons uh, left the game within a year um, of first starting as a referee. And unfortunately, that's far too common a story uh, for young referees that enter the game. Um, so as a coach, how can we assist the referees if there is an abusive parent on the sidelines? The easiest way to assist the referee is to talk to the parents or talk to even better, talk to the other parents to calm down that parent. Uh, please let them know that this is not acceptable behavior. Uh, let them know that if this was their daughter, would anybody accept, would you accept somebody yelling at them that way? That, that would be the best thing to do. Uh, we don't want you to get confrontational with that person. We just want you to calmly explain to them 
that the referee is learning as well as their child is learning. Thank you, Ali. Uh, just to add on to that, I think that the cultural piece is very important. So setting expectations of parent behavior ahead of time. Um, but then there's also, uh, we have to have something to lean on. So whether it's punitive, um, whether it's something that the parents are aware of that should they um, behave inappropriately, whether it's towards referees, um, other parents, then perhaps it's their player is going to sit or their player will be benched. Uh, their son and daughter um, because if there isn't any um, punitive or uh, opportunity for the coach to have a tool uh, to stop that parent behavior it's going to be very difficult during the flow of the game to uh, to stop it one of the other things that mass youth is doing is creating a uh, set of guidelines uh, or acceptable behavior type uh, model uh, that they're going to pass out to all the uh, leagues uh, that hopefully that'll come soon. And that'll be part of uh, what you guys will be learning uh, as soon as it's uh, rolled out. Excellent. So we're going to open up the floor to questions. So attendees, please feel free to open up your mic. Uh, Ellie, if you want to turn the screen share off and we'll be able to see everyone a little bit larger. Um, please also feel free to jump into the chat box and ask any questions. Mr. Trudeau, it's nice to see you again, even though I'm not seeing your... Anybody? Guys, you're too easy, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kendall. Hi, I was um, just meeting with um, my co-coaches last night and we were told that some of the towns are, may not have a referee for a given game. And, you know, I think one of those coaches went to Darwin Molina um, and we're just kind of waiting on a response. If coaches are tasked with refereeing a game because there's just not enough referees or officials in that particular town or at that field, what are sort of like the, the top specific things that you want coaches, like take this most seriously, make this the priority. And what are the things like, can we just say like, listen, you, you guys are going to have to, you know, call your own throw-ins. Like you have the best view. You we're going to have to trust you today. You know, you've got, you got a coach, coach can't be everywhere. And sort of like a little honor policy there. What, you know, we as coaches, not actual referees or parents, not actual referees are going to focus on is more, you know, X, Y, and Z. I, I think what I, what you're asking me is what is a referee's job? <laughs> so, so I'm going to, I'm going to put it very simply for you, the safety of the players. Okay. In every decision that we make, safety is topmost in our mind, believe it or not. So even the fouls that are, that we call the reason the they're written into the laws of the game is because of the safety of the players more than anything else. So if we keep, safety in mind. I don't care if one team gets the throw in or the other, we're there to learn more than anything else uh, at this at these age levels. Uh, I do understand that every game is is the World Cup and you guys work hard for those games. But let's keep in mind that it is a game that these people are learning at. And we don't want to get to the point where it gets so serious that they lose track of having fun and enjoying the game as opposed to competing uh, for, for whatever it is they're competing for. That, that's my opinion. I, I'm not belittling what you guys are doing out there. I just want to make sure that the perspective still stays there about learning, uh, uh, social, social uh, interaction with other kids, camaraderie, uh, safety and fun. Those are those are some things that we've lost track of as 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 players and coaches. Do you think it's appropriate to enlist a parent from each side to assist with offsides, for example, or is that sort of Why inviting not? more? Okay. Why not? Actually, to be honest with you, I would enlist a parent to sit the one the most boisterous parent to be a referee. Let them get in the middle of the game and try to make those decisions. Uh, Joe, please. Uh, actually, Ellie, this, this is Mike Borsla. Let me just add to that. Sorry, Mike. Um, 
using another computer as Rob has commandeered the account for tonight. Um, so, uh, Kendall, that's uh, that's a great question because unfortunately, uh, we will be seeing uh, a very large percentage of games not covered. Uh, the assigners are going to do their best to provide the referees at the games where they're needed the most. Uh, and that is based on a priority from the league. So it could be the older games. It could be uh, more division one games. So compare or division two or divisions three, four and five, depending on the league you're in, uh, may not be able to have games assigned. And so uh, whenever you're called out there to uh, as, as a coach or assistant coach to referee, Ellie's absolutely right. It's player safety is number one. And you really, you'll find that how easy it is when, when you're thinking player safety, uh, it's easy to call the fouls because if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't right. Now, another thing that you can do that we've learned that really, really helps, if, if that's the situation, coaches go talk to your parents, let them know the situation, you know, reinforce that unfortunately, we don't have a referee today because we've lost a lot of referees to parents yelling on the sidelines. Let them know why. And that if you want to lose coaches, keep yelling. And that, uh, you know, we need your help. And so that's something very important uh, to, uh, to take a look at and to, to handle. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Joe? Yeah, okay. I was just going to pipe in when Mike came in. Uh, nice to hear from you, Mike. Uh, I want to share with you some of the things that we do that I've done uh, in Italy and in Southeast Asia. Um, and one is regarding the point that Kendall brought up about, I think it was Kendall, on the assistant, assistant referees. Uh, what is done very often where there isn't offsides in the match is the teams will carry two goalkeepers. And what the team does is, is one of the goalkeepers plays in goal, the other is an assistant referee. And so those goalkeepers are active through the entire match. It sort of helps, it helps in the, the uh, uh, regulating of the game and it also gives the goalkeeper something to do rather than sitting there for half a game waiting to play. Uh, so that's one of the things we did. Now, when there is no referee, uh, what we have done quite successfully is not call on parents because that can be a little bit difficult and there can be uh, some, uh, some risk management issues, but coaches have the two coaches in addition to what they're doing, they're also the referee. And what ends up happening is that they sort of temper a bit uh, their excitement about the game because they have to be a referee. They sort of watch each other on the calls and the, the players themselves also self-regulate. And so, whereas they try to get away with things with the referee, when they are regulating themselves or the coaches are, are regulating them, they don't do that. So in extreme cases, you always get the match off. It's a question whether the, the uh, uh, league will sanction a match where, where the referee is not there. But what I've found is that, that leagues are more than happy to get these games played. Uh, and if they can get the game played and get everybody happy and everybody's safe at the end of the day, they've just fulfilled all the requirements. It's really tough being a referee, uh, referee Ellie. I, I, my heart goes out to you, but I've seen it all over the world. I put some comments uh, about fatigue. I put some comments about mentoring. When I was talking about mentoring, that's at a senior level. Even where a, uh, somebody will come down from the referees department, he will watch the referees and he will go in at halftime and he will talk with them if they're not doing a good job. If they're doing a good job, you're not going to talk with them. But some referees have got a lot of experience. And like referee Ellie says, some referees don't have any experience and they need help. And we should not be there to abuse them. We're there to help them. That's about all I have to say. Thank you, Joe. Brian? Hi, thank you. Uh, I've been refing for about 20 years and coaching for about 23 years. My advice, uh, Kendall, is um, if coaches have to step in to, to referee as well. Um, I would call as many fouls as quickly, you know, as early in the match as possible and call them around midfield um, so that you can get the players under control. Um, and as coaches, you don't want to end up making calls 
that are deciding a match in a box, you know, for your own team. And so as much as possible, if you can set the tenor of the match early by making calls around midfield where, you know, it's not going to make as much of a difference, that would be my two cents. Brian, you're giving away the secrets of the trade now. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Actually, that, that that's a great point. That's a great point. And that is, believe it or not, that is a secret of the trade. As referees become more advanced, uh, one of the things we do teach them is call, make the call early, make the call often so that everybody can see what's going on and, and set that line, set that bar early so that everybody understands where you want to, where you want to control the game. That's a great point, Brian. Thank you. Anybody else, ladies and gentlemen? I, I hope that you guys didn't feel that I was uh, scolding you or browbeating you in any way. My, my entire objective is just to give you some food for thought about what's out there. And by the way, for the people who are not there currently, when you guys talk, please convey our, our wishes to them. Please convey our thoughts to them. Let them know that we're not we're not totally blind to what they do, and how hard you guys work. Uh, we we understand it, and we we want to work with you on this. Ellie, from a coach's perspective, um, if you recognize that a referee is struggling um, or is uh, overwhelmed during a game, what is an appropriate conversation or way to approach that referee um, to help them out? One of the best things that I've seen work with referees who are struggling is positive reinforcement. When they make the positive decision, the good decision, let them know that they did a good job instead of harping on whatever bad decisions they're making. That's how you build their confidence. Uh, as opposed to yelling at them for making the wrong decision, it only serves to continue that, that thought process and makes them worse as you go along. So if you pick out something that they did right, and please be careful not to be sarcastic, uh, because a lot of times, uh, hey, that was finally a good and good good call. That doesn't help. And I'm I know you guys are not doing that. I'm just I'm just saying, be careful the way you come across, but be positive with them. Let them know they're they're doing better, and that'll help their confidence, and they start building on that. Mr. Trudeau. Hi, Ellie. Um, just just to add on to that a little bit, um, I know the the league up in our area. Uh, another um, vehicle for a coach to to help is a coach's report after the game that they can submit uh, on the website. I don't know if every league has that um, uh, you know available to them, but it could be an email to the assigner. My my point would be, please try to be objective. Don't don't put a motion into any criticism you might be br uh, bringing up to to an assigner or to the league that a referee might have had. Report f facts. That, um, what you saw is what might have been deficiencies that the referee needs to to work on. That's the way to get a positive response not to be emotional um, and, and, you know, put your opinion in that the referee costs us the game, for example, uh, anything like that. Please be factual in, in what you send in. Um, and, and quite frankly, I can tell you up, up in our area, when those reports are, um, are submitted to the league, the, the assigner follows up on them and um, they get advisors out to work with the referee at the next game. So it, it can be a, a, a positive uh, vehicle to, to help the referee improve. I, I wanna mention something, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, by the way, uh, the comment that, uh, let me see here, Joe put on the uh, chat, you're absolutely correct. They are doing six and seven games in tournaments sometimes. And their, their decision-making process at the end of that day is very, very bad. You're absolutely right about that. But unfortunately, we don't have choices. 
we're very restricted on referees and we have to just basically bear with it. Uh, I don't, <laughs> the players, uh, the referees out there who are young, who are 16, 17 years old, I want you to keep in mind, they don't get yelled at at home. They don't get yelled at and scolded in school. Everything is positive for them. In society, they don't get yelled at. And then they step on the field and they're being screamed at. It is a shock to their system. They don't understand why all of a sudden everybody's yelling at them. Society today is going away from the scolding and yelling at at kids because it's not positive. This is why I brought up the positive reinforcement when they make do something right. So consider that out there of what what the what the culture is. Rob. Yeah, um, uh, Justin is on the call. So Justin was a player that I uh, coached back in Wilmington. So uh, up to 10 years ago, um, he's currently in the library at WPI. Um, but he sent me a few private messages and he um, been quite frank with regard to the parent behavior. Um, and he helps to mentor younger referees as well. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't a full crew on a lot of games Um and one of the biggest complaints he gets from the younger referees isn't because of the coaching, it's because of the parents and the lack of control um, that the coaches have over the parents. Um, so it's, obviously we have some tools and resources that we, uh, we can share, the soccer parenting and the sideline project. Um, attitudes are contagious as well, but there really does need to be a concerted effort, um, not just from referee groups and the state association, but anybody involved in coaching um, to really ensure that the environment that we're setting for the children, for the referees and young developing referees uh, is appropriate. Um, and it starts with those who are responsible um, for the players on the field and ultimately the parents, as you said in your presentation, and that's the coaches. We have to take a lot more responsibility for the attitudes, for the behavior of our parents on the sideline and hold them accountable to a standard. Let me uh, uh, actually... Let me follow up on that, Ellie, then I'll let you jump in. Is um, at the state office, we, uh, we have several, several more. Unfortunately, last fall, it was more than several incidents that bubbled up to our state office for us to get involved in. Uh, and anything that uh, you know, had to do with uh, sideline behavior, whether it was uh, you know, coaches or adults or the such, Let's focus on adults. I can almost say to to uh, you know, to, to the T that when I talk to the organizations who are having these complaints, having these situations, having grievances, having discipline, you name it, that if that organization, that town or club, makes it a part of their regular process to have pre-season meetings with parents setting the expectations with parents, letting them know what is right and wrong. I mean, having that clear communication with parents, I can tell you we hardly ever hear about problems. It's then when I talk to somebody and they had a parent blow up on the sidelines and pacing back and forth and ranting and raving and, and flailing their arms. And I would say, well, can, tell me a little bit about your preseason meeting that you had with the parents. Oh, I sent them an email and that's it, done. Or I, oh, I don't have one, they, they, that's not my job. I, I coach the kids. Well, I, I can tell you that is it's so powerful to have that preseason meeting with the parents, setting expectations, not only for what you do as a coach and how you operate as a coach, but also what they, how they need to behave on the sidelines, what is proper, what is inappropriate, and it makes a huge difference because not only do we not hear problems from those teams, but I know it will help us with referee retention. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You you went where I was going to go. We're great minds think alike. Kendall, is that a future referee next to you? <laughs> uh, my this is my theatrical daughter. My future referee is uh, is downstairs after. Uh, a little strength and conditioning. I heard that's kind of bubbling up for the kids, but Very good. she's, uh, Very she's good. my little one. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, anybody else? 
Oh, there's something in the chat here. Yeah, um, excellent point. Excellent point. I like that. Uh, <laughs> ambassadors. <laughs> yes, perfect. Thank you, Brian. Also a good one. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything else that we can address? Uh, I'm more than happy to. And even if you could, th if you think about it later and you want to ask me a question, please drop me a line at syra dot, uh, at massref dot net s-y-r-a at massref.net. Uh, I have made a commitment that I will respond to every communication within 24 hours. And I'm hoping I'm holding to that. I, I don't think I've missed that yet. Uh, I, will, I may say, thank you, I got your email. I will get back to you, but at least you'll know that I did get your email or your voicemail, whichever, whichever you choose. Rob, anything else? No, I would just like to say on behalf of Mass Youth Soccer and uh, member organizations and leagues, thank you very much, Ellie, for sharing your time this evening. Um, it is greatly appreciated. And uh, we are very appreciative of the support and collaboration that MSRC uh, is providing to help us provide the best possible playing environments for players across the state. It's, it's my pleasure. Actually, let me ask Mr. Alderman. Good, after, good evening, Mr. Alderman. You're muted, sir. You need to unmute yourself. Otherwise, my ears don't work. <clears throat> I should know that by now. Um, <laughs> good evening, Ellie. Um, there are a couple of good links and information that were put in the chat, but I noticed that we can't save the chat. Um, is there any way that you guys can provide that for us? I will yeah, I believe we have the chat saved so we can, uh, we can save the links and send them out afterwards to those that attend in that. Not a problem. This video will also be recorded and added to the website um, and sent to anyone who registered for the uh, the Zoom call as well. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Mr. Scott. Uh, good evening, guys. I'm sorry I joined late at another meeting that ran um, longer than I thought it would. I think these Zoom calls are always kind of like that nowadays. Um, I'm in charge of the NEP, and, and um, recently what we did was we, we kind of not mandated, but we asked our parents uh, across all the clubs to take the sideline project, um, and we've got uh, I think at this point, about 2,500 parents have taken the course, which is great. But we also sent a survey to U.S. officials who we outsource, obviously, for, for our referees. And we asked them to pass it out to referees and see if they could provide us feedback um, and give referee feedback, which I'm not sure we've ever done, right, as leagues um, to actually ask what the referees feel. And we've now got that data back, which I'm happy to share with, with, with everyone, right, and, and that, that's on this call or, you know, in the soccer landscape. And one of the things that we tried to tie into that survey was that we were doing this for the parents. There is a ton of referees that said, that's great. That's great that you're doing it for the parents. You need to address the coaches. So we have our AGM tomorrow and, and that's something I'm gonna share the feedback and share the survey feedback with our directors, our club directors and our coaches. But it was very telling when you look at these, the referees and their feedback, it's one thing to address the parents, but they believe that the coaches are equally guilty, if you will, um, and that they wanted to make sure that we were addressing the coaches. And I think that's a, that's a balance, right, that we strike. And, I, and somebody a few minutes ago mentioned the adults, right? It's the, the adults are the ones that are many times the issue here. And if we can support the adults on both touchlines, then we're ultimately supporting the kids, right? And I think one of the things we saw this past fall was that some of the kids now are taking the, the direction of the, the adults and they're becoming part of the issue. And so it's, it, it's, it, it's disgusting some of the things that we hear, but I really feel like it, you know, this call is so helpful. Um, and if we continue as a group to, you know, to support our referees, our coaches, our clubs, our families, our parents, our players are gonna benefit. Um, and that's obviously what hopefully we're all into, in it for, right? So Rob and I spoke a little bit earlier this week and I'm super thankful Ellie for, for all your advice and, and your support. And we'll do our bit as much as we can on, on our side from a league perspective to, to help the, the process and be part of the change and part of the, the positive change that is. Thank you, Scott, I appreciate it. And by the way, I'd like to offer to do this uh, to your coaches, if you'd like. Uh, I'm sure, I don't know what time you came on, but one of the things that we did was we, we highlighted the word role model for as a coach. So 
uh, that was part of the presentation that we went through. And we do understand that whatever the coach does, the players are going to do it. They're going to feed off of them directly. And, and thank you for your comment. That's terrific. Actually, I would like, if at all possible, if you could share the results of your uh, surveys. Uh, is that possible? Yeah, it's it's all gridded out. And I'm happy to kick it over to Rob or to Mike. And I might even have your email somewhere, Ali. But um, if you want to put it in the chat, too, I can ha happily send it to you guys as well. That's fantastic. It is in the chat. Thanks, guys. Hey, Rob, or Adam, forgive me. Would you be willing to share your survey? Not <clears throat> the actual, like the questions themselves? Yeah, and I actually think, to be honest, like we, we could probably do, I think the next survey if we were to do, and we'd probably, we'd probably think about parent questions, right? So some of the questions are, have you ever, you know, have you ever heard from a, a parent touchline or spectator touchline, like instructions given to a player, right? Or have you ever heard a, a negative comment? So some of them are just, you know, we're trying to find these answers. And then there's a strongly agree, disagree, and in the middle, and then there's this sort of the gradient uh, in between. Um, but I'm happy to do that. We actually work with Arizona State University, a professor there who kind of works with data analytics. Um, to try to, you know, help figure out where we could land with the survey. But it was quite telling right off the bat that we could have added a lot more questions. And I think with the referee feedback, which is awesome, because um, we always hear about from the coaches, right, from the parents. It's like, is anybody asking the referees who are numbers are, you know, drastically dropping off? We need to, we need to have that sort of that, that well-rounded approach. But I'm happy to share the questions. I'm happy to to put that over to, you know, again, to Robert, to Mike, or to Ellie, and, and you guys can distribute as you need to. But um, I think we would like to do what we told the referees is we're going to do one at the end of the spring. And the hope is that we would have hopefully some positive change in, in, the, in, in the environments for the referees and that the survey results would be different from the beginning of the spring to the end. That's, that is fingers crossed. <laughs> hopefully that happens. Uh, one thing I'd like to impress on everybody, this is not going to happen in one season or one year. This is a long-term process that we got to work at. This is something that it's going to be a culture change. It's not going to be something that we do and say, oh, and we're done. Uh, I'm, I'm here for the long term. As long as Ma Mass Youth uh, lets me stay, this is, this is going to be my focus more than anything else because I'm passionate about my kids. Just like you're passionate about yours, I'm passionate about mine. And I want to make sure that we at least start the ball rolling in the right direction, if nothing else. Uh, thank you for your comment, Brian, on the chat. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, Ali, thank you again. Uh, in the interest of everyone's time, I don't want to keep you all evening. Uh, next week, our coaching conversation is with Boston Children's Hospital. Um, we have a child psychologist and a professor um, who specializes in social media from Brown University. And we're gonna be discussing mental health in adolescents and the impact of social media on uh, young athletes. So a really hot button and important topic. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys then, but thank you again for attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you out on the fields this spring. Take care. Thank you everybody.